go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Gerlach, and I am the Executive Coordinator for the Rocky Mountains Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit, or CESU. And I want to thank you for joining us this afternoon for the first seminar in our 2023 online series. This is the uh, third series that we're, um, we're offering. Um, and it's been a fun way for us to showcase the talent and work of the faculty and students um, of our CESU partners. Uh, our theme this year is understanding, documenting, and interpreting human history and cultural resources within our Western landscape. Um, and before I introduce today's speaker, I want to bring your attention to our next two seminars. On March 9th, we'll have uh, Bob Reinhardt. Bob is a professor of history at Boise State University, and Bob will be presenting on the Atlas of Drowned Towns. This is a public history project that explores the history histories of dozens of communities in the American West inundated by dam construction in the 20th century. And then on April 5th, we'll be, we'll be joined by Kat Lajos. Kat is a professor of uh, architecture and historic preservation at the University of Colorado, Denver. Uh, I don't have a title yet from Kat, but Kat has been doing historic preservation work uh, for the National Park Service and other agencies through our CESU for many years. And no doubt, uh, Kat will have a very interesting and informative presentation for you. For more information um, on those seminars, uh, and or if you're interested in checking out recordings of our past seminars, um, I'll drop the link to our CESU seminar page in the chat box for you. Today, I'm excited to have Doug McDonald here with us. Uh, Doug is a professor of archaeology here at the University of Montana. And as his uh, title suggests, um, he and his students have been working in Yellowstone National Park for many years. Um, Doug's research focus is lithic analysis, uh, including study of the procurement, production, use, and discard of stone tools by Native American hunter and gatherers. He has published five books, including three on, Yellow, on Yellowstone, and his most recent is entitled Before Yellowstone, Native American Archaeology in the National Park. If today's presentation leaves you wanting to know more information, you might want to check that book out. For now, I'm happy to turn the controls over to Doug. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate you asking me to be a part of your uh, seminar series and to open it up and uh, talk about how we've gone about recording cultural resources and historic resources in Yellowstone. Um, since 2007, our, our projects got initiated in 2006 when I arrived at the University of Montana, but we didn't really get out and in, into the park until 2007. But this upcoming summer in 2023, hopefully, uh, if we make it there, will be our 17th in a row. And so we've we've been really uh, pleased and and uh, have enjoyed our time working with the Elston National Park. With uh, I think almost all of our agreements being facilitated through the Rocky Mountain Cooperative Ecosystem Study Unit. So this particular talk is uh, about how we've gone about setting up the project, some of its successes. Um, what what makes a good project? I, I assume that um, most of the folks watching the CESU seminar series are mostly professionals, maybe looking to see how a project is set up and how it can get going and be successful. And so I'll try to throw some, those sorts of things in there. But I also just want to highlight some of the some of those successful outcomes. Um, one of the successful outcomes of the project certainly is. The one that I'm most proud of is student participation. So I'm a professor at the University of Montana, I'm housed in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Montana, and I'm an archaeologist. 
Um, as many of you know, archaeology typically is within departments of anthropology in the United States. Um, and so our students enter our anthropology department as either undergraduates or graduate students. We have um, a master's and a PhD program at the University of Montana. And so uh, get a lot of undergrads and then uh, also a lot of graduate students. And so the photo you're we're looking at right here of these beautiful bears uh, crossing the road. I remember the day that the student Braden Tobin is his name. I remember the day that he took this photo. Uh, there was of course a bear jam and he got up out of the window of our vehicle as we were stopped and took this great, great picture as the bears uh, walked in front of our um, University of Montana truck. And uh, what a great shot. So he, he's one of our students that's had some success. And so he, uh, after he graduated in 2021 from the University of Montana, he had an undergraduate um, bachelor's degree. He worked with me for about two years um, uh, and then went to work for the Forest Service. I think he was based in McCall um, over there in Idaho, McCall, Idaho Forest Service, and uh, now is applying to graduate school and probably will be a graduate student up at the University of Alaska in Anchorage at their Department of Anthropology program. He's he's from Alaska. I tried to get him to come to the University of Montana, but he must be sick of me. Um, so yeah, the Montana Yellowstone uh, Archaeological Project uh, has been going on for, for now. This will be the 17th summer and our, our primary goal is to train students. Um, and I'll talk about different students that have participated. This is a picture of us from last summer, Sean Bowerbank, one of our graduate students in our Department of Anthropology. He's gonna be uh, writing a thesis about some of our work up near uh, Mammoth, the Mammoth area. Uh, and there's Caroline Gold. She's not, not one of our students, but she is from Yellowstone National Park and is currently an employee there and helped us on a project uh, last summer, and that just is an example of how we collaborate. Um, I'll talk about different different folks at Yellowstone over the course of the lecture, but Beth Horton uh, provided Caroline's assistance. Uh, Beth Horton's the Yellowstone Park archaeologist and uh, has been instrumental in our uh, project's um, success over the last uh, few years since she's been at the park and, and has really helped us train students and in this Upcoming summer, we're hoping to have an archaeological field school in Yellowstone and, and uh, give the give the students an insight into what it, what it's like to be a Yellowstone Park archaeologist. Um, and so Beth has uh, been gracious about uh, participating with us and helping to set up that archaeological field school. And we'll probably get to work with Caroline if if that ends up up happening. So our primary goal of the Montana Yellowstone Archaeological Project is, is to train students. We're also out there helping Yellowstone. So our CESU, our Cooperative Ecosystem Study Unit agreements, um, we're typically uh, grant agreements and, and Yellowstone provides us with funding to bring students out in the field. So they're getting experience, but we're also doing projects for, for Yellowstone. So uh, the particular project that you're looking at on the screen right now is uh, one in which we were surveying popular backcountry trails. So this was one up in the Gallatin Mountains. I'll talk a little bit about those um, over the course of the, the talk. Uh, but those are some of the greatest projects because we're out in, in the middle of nowhere, out, up in the mountains, as you can see here with uh, Sean and Caroline. Um, identifying archaeological sites along those trails that are important for Yellowstone to protect. So uh, in the past, they've they've uh, managed to reroute some trails around really important Native, most of the sites that we identify are Native American archaeological sites, uh, but certainly we've also participated a lot around developed areas in Yellowstone in, in identifying European American historic archaeological sites as well. Both are equally important in the eyes of cultural resources and cultural resource management. So in addition to training students, we also are identifying the locations and mapping archaeological sites and providing that information to Yellowstone so that they can go about protecting the sites if, if they need to. So um, I would say those are the two primary foci, foci, foci focuses of, of, of the Montana Yellowstone Archaeological Project in the collaboration between us at the University of Montana and Yellowstone National Park. So on the one hand, my main goal is to train students. On the other hand, Yellowstone's main goal, even though they, they love having the students participate and get experience, they're really, you know, their job is to identify important cultural resources and make sure they're protected. 
Um, a third outgrowth is, is research. And so I'll talk a little bit about some of those outcomes, those successful things that we've done. Lisa mentioned off the top that we've published some books, had some articles, lots of theses and dissertations. And so there are, so what we're trying to do is not just go out there and, and identify sites necessarily, although that's super important. We're also trying to generate research for our students and, and for myself, you know, part of my, uh, reason that I can keep my job is because I have to do research. So as a, as a professor in the Department of Anthropology, um, I have to do research in addition to my university service as well as teaching classes. And so that research has, has translated into the classroom. I actually mm -hmm. teach a class at the University of Montana every fall to about 100 students called Archaeology of Yellowstone. It's just a fun 100 level class that introduces um, young students to archaeology, uh, from the perspective of Yellowstone, which everybody loves in the, in, <laughs> in the first place. So it's a, it's, it's a fun class um, that uh, lets us use our research to also just train students a little bit, at least in the classroom. And then the ultimate outgrowth is, is uh, you know, we're trying to translate all this stuff and the research in particular into understanding the pre-contact history of, of Yellowstone National Park and the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, from the Native American perspective. So what's the longevity of Native Americans in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and Yellowstone National Park? What is, um, you know, what changes over time? What, what sorts of research issues can we identify? How can, how can the park collaborate with the tribes to understand the, their history in the park? And um, so that's, a, that's been a great outcome too, is uh, identifying and better understanding the longevity and, and just uh, the intensity of use of Yellowstone. I think most people, when they look at Yellowstone as outsiders, look at it as a, obviously a park that's a natural park. Um, I'll talk about that on the next slide or two, um, but the difference between nas the national park systems, natural parks versus cultural parks. So because Yellowstone is such a natural park with beautiful geology and wildlife, the cultural resources sometimes, not always, but sometimes gets, uh, overlooked so it's been a really valuable outcome of um of this project the, the montana yellowstone archaeological project with the help of the cesu to facilitate all these projects to better understand native american history in the park and so this timeline gives you an over i, I did want to um spend a little time giving you an overview of the timeline of how the project got set up, as well as some of the important players, because there's been a, um, a lot of important individuals that have contributed to the success of the Montana Yellowstone Archaeological Project. So in the winter of 2006, 2007, um, I had set up a meeting with, with Yellowstone at the time. Ann Johnson was the park archaeologist. She has since retired, and Beth Horton has her job now. And also Elaine Hale was the Yellowstone Parks archeologist for the Federal Highways projects. And since that time, Tom James has taken over in that role. But back in 2006, 2007, Ann Johnson and Elaine Hale um, were really receptive to welcoming the University of Montana. I had just started as a faculty member in 2006. And so contacted Ann and Elaine because it's Yellowstone and I, I thought it would be fun to work there, but also because uh, Anne and Elaine are both alumni of uh, the University of Montana. They both got um, degrees from the University of Montana, and they are um, they were very receptive to welcoming us there. So we had our first field school in 2007. That field school didn't have funding through the park. The funding came actually from the Cooperative Ecosystem Study Unit. Christine Whitaker was the uh, coordinator at the time, and, and she loved the idea of this collaboration between the University of Montana and Yellowstone National Park and came up with, I think it was about $7,000 that uh, she came up with to help us initiate this. It was a field school that first summer in 2007, it was down there in, uh, in the Gardner Basin, that photograph uh, down to the right there is um, where we conducted some of our archeology span just north of uh, the Gardner High School along the Yellowstone River. Um, so Christine Whitaker of the CESU was hugely instrumental in getting this project up and running and providing some funding out of pools of money that the CESU had to, to uh, facilitate the success and, and the ongoing success of it. And obviously since that time, the co collaboration's not just been between the University of Montana and Yellowstone, but also with the Rocky Mountain Cooperative Ecosystem Study Unit being a really important partner in facilitating all of those agreements. 
Um, Tobin Root came on board, and some of these dates are just off the top of my head, so it might have been a year or two either way for Tobin, but Tobin Roop took over as the cultural resources program director some, somewhere around there and um, has, has obviously been a very important player in, uh, in, in, in facilitating these agreements as well. Uh, Palin Yu took over at the Cooperative Ecosystem Study Union as coordinator there in 2009, 2010. Uh, we became close friends. She was uh, on campus here at the University of Montana in Missoula, and we hit it off really well, and we're still still very good friends to this day. Um, Stefan Peterson took over as the park archaeologist, uh, was the first one to take over after Ann Johnson retired, and he was there for a few years, and we did some great projects with him. Eventually, Beth Horton, um, a fellow alumni uh, alumnus of the Washington State University, where I where I was also in school. We didn't go to school together, but we both graduated uh, with our doctoral degrees from Washington State University in Pullman. Um, she arrived in the park about 2016. Same with Tom James taking over um, as the Yellowstone Highways archaeologist around that around that same time, give or take. Um, and so, since that time, uh, and, and along. Since Beth and Tom have taken over in their roles as important cultural resource coordinators, that, that along with Tobin Roop, who's still in still working as cultural resource manager uh, in Yellowstone, um, we've had a lot of successes together. So it's it's been a team uh, collaboration. So a lot I, I couldn't obviously do it without the park wanting us to be there, <laughs> and without the CESU thinking it's a good project that we're going to be training students. That's one of the you know one of the things about the CESU agreements is uh, between universities and federal agencies is it has to have an important student um, aspect. Um, so what I was talking about earlier is this, one of the things when I first started the project with Ann Johnson and Elaine Hale, there was, uh, they kept talking about this dichotomy between cultural and natural parks. Uh, so in the National Park Service system. So a lot of you out there, I don't know if you're all some or all are working for the National Park Service, um, but obviously they manage, you know, hundreds and hundreds of parks across the country, some of which are can be considered cultural or historical parks, and others are natural parks, right? So parks like Yellowstone, Yosemite, Glacier are considered these natural parks where they're important for their natural beauty, whereas you have parks like a Gettysburg Military Park in Pennsylvania, for example, is a good example of a cultural or historical park. And I, the, when I first started working with Yellowstone, the park archaeologists were really struggling. Elaine and Anne were really struggling with this dichotomy because they weren't getting a lot of funding, and they were because natural resources was getting getting a lot of it. I think don't think that's the case much anymore. Although maybe it is. I don't work for the National Park Service, so I don't know if that's still present. But at the time, that was part of the impetus of Yellowstone embracing us because we could come in and do a lot of these projects for very minimal costs. Like I said, that first year, even though Yellowstone didn't have funding, um, the CESU helped out and provided that initial um, funding stimulus, if you will, to get the project uh, up and running. So one of, the, one of the things that they were trying to do was break down this dichotomy and say, hey, look, man, National Park Service needs to understand that there's a tremendous wealth of cultural resources in places like Yellowstone, like Yosemite, like Glacier. They are not just natural parks. We have to recognize the human history and the human Native American history uh, in places like Yellowstone, even though for the most part, the public sees them as wildlife and geologic parks in Yellowstone. We as a cultural resource group have a job to do to teach the public about the important cultural aspects, the human aspects of the park. So that was one of the reasons that they were so excited to get our project going, and I think it's been successful. You know, their original impetus to um, to solve this problem, at least in Yellowstone, I hopefully, I think to a certain extent, we've we've done a pretty good job in, in helping them um, break that dichotomy down, at least in Yellowstone. It still goes on. I, I'm sure that the Yellowstone Park employees can tell you more about that. But um, and so that. That natural versus cultural dichotomy came through. So we published this book in, called Before Yellowstone a couple of years ago. I think it came out in 2018. Uh, is that really five years ago? Wow. Um, and uh, the cover on the right is the way the book looks. But when I originally intended to have it published, it was the University of Washington. I had had Eric Carlson, a local Missoula ar archaeologist, but also a very outstanding artist, 
uh, do this painting on the left of the first Clovis Native Americans to see Old Faithful at Yellowstone. So it was, I had provided him with a photograph. Uh, you can see Old Faithful erupting and imagining those first people ever to walk, those first Native Americans, hunter-gatherer peoples, to, using Clovis culture, cultural uh, technologies to walk up and see it. It's for all of us, when we go to a place like Old Faithful, when we first see it, even when I take my students there, when I see them see it for the first time, it's pretty incredible. But just imagine being that first, <laughs> that first family of Clovis hunters uh, to, to actually hunter gatherers to walk up and actually see it. So that was the vision of the, what I thought would be the book cover. But even University of Washington couldn't get this. You know, even they ended up with the cover on the right because they had this vision of Yellowstone as this natural park, and that's how they interpreted the public would see it as well. So they went with a cover on the right, which com completely misses the point in, in my mind, but um, they thought it was a more eye-catching cover. So they would, they did you choose the cover on the right and the, the painting on the left is in the book, but it's not, it didn't end up on the cover. So that natural cultural dichotomy still exists and, and uh, at least in the eyes of some aspects of the public and certainly was present when the editors at University of Washington were making the decision when I first submitted the one on the left, I said, this is going to be the cover. They laughed and said, that's not a cover. So what I'm going to do now is just talk to you about some of the projects we've done, talk about some of the areas we've worked. We've worked all over uh, Yellowstone. The, the map on, on your left there shows you, you know, the outline of what's considered to be the greater Yellowstone ecosystem in yellow, the park boundary of what is Yellowstone National Park in red, relative to, relative to the states of Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming there. Um, <clears throat> so we've worked all over the park, so I'm just going to give you some examples of places we worked uh, and show you some pretty pictures and uh, highlight some of the things that we've learned about the Native American history of, uh, of Yellowstone. And so we've been lucky enough to work all around Yellowstone Lake. So Yellowstone Lake is in the center of the park. It's, the, uh, it's right there in the, the center of that map up in the upper left. It is 20 miles long, 15 miles wide, and it's it's one of the really active locations of Native Americans in, in Yellowstone National Park. It was really, really actively used by multiple different tribes coming from lots of different directions. This one is a this photograph that you're looking at here is a photograph that I took. It's probably one of the first times we were at Yellowstone Lake, maybe 2009, 2010, but over the years, that years from say 2009 to 2012, we along uh, other archeologists had surveyed a lot of it and studied a lot of it for us, but we were able to, with a cooperative ecosystem study unit agreement uh, collaborated on by Ann Johnson at the time, finish all the survey around that. It's like 115 miles of lake shore. So all the entire circumference of the lake has been surveyed and studied. Uh, and many of those sites have been tested. Now, the real important thing about that is that many of the important sites are at backcountry camp locations. So one of the cool things you can do in Yellowstone Lake, in Yellowstone National Park, is, is canoe around the lake and stay at these backcountry sites. It's probably not a coincidence at all that almost every location where Yellowstone decided to put a backcountry camp for canoeists and kayakers, there is a Native American archaeological site. Because guess what? A good place to camp 11,000 years ago is still a good place to camp today. And so lots of those sites... Um, we were able to survey them, identify them, help Yellowstone sort of manage those resources uh, and that sort of thing. And, and what a rewarding project that was. We, we had uh, several students participating in that. Uh, lots of research came out of it, lots of good uh, articles, theses. Uh, we traveled around, we got so much gear. These, these are the two canoes we used at, at Yellowstone Lake. And we had four archeologists, all of our screens, equipment, excavation gear, coolers for beer, food, all of our camp gear for all four of us, I know I'm leaving something out, all fit into those two canoes as we traveled around the southern end of the lake where it's the no motor area of the lake. In the northern part of the lake, you can use motorboats and, and we would use the motorboat to drop us off. Then we'd canoe in those real backcountry parts of the lake. But definitely probably the one of the more memorable experiences that I've had as an archaeologist in Yellowstone and um, I think for the students that participated. You can see the stocky white is in the front of that red canoe. He got his dissertation 
uh, at, the, at our University of Montana, you can see he just has a smile on his face in that photo because he's happy to be there. And, and I think we all were. So Yellowstone Lake has been an important part of it. We found all kinds of stuff around the shore of the lake. Like I said, it really was actively used in the past uh, by Native Americans uh, before the park was established in 1872, all the way up to, <laughs> to that time. It was very actively used by um, lots of different Native American tribes coming from different directions. Uh, and so we've had a lot of fun um, uh, doing the archaeology there. If you look at the, on the right, I'd say the projectile points on the right are the most important. Uh, the one on the far right is just to show you the scale. That's actually from the Anzac Clovis site up in uh, Wilson. But the point just down next to it um, is, our, is our, one of the two Clovis points that we found in Yellowstone. So it shows that Native Americans were using Yellowstone National Park uh, 11,000 years ago. Um, Osprey Beach, really important archaeological site. Ann Johnson uh, was the park archaeologist instrumental in excavating that site. It dates to about nine or 10,000 years ago and uh, probably is one of the handful of most important archaeological sites in the park. Um, then up in the area around Fishing Bridge is another important place where lots of archaeology is uh, located at the where the Yellowstone River headwaters come out of, out of the lake and, and start on their way north up towards Gardner. Um, there's, interestingly enough, archaeological sites on all of the islands in the middle of Yellowstone Lake. And so there was a big debate about whether Native Americans used canoes or boats to get around the lake or whether they just walked on the frozen ice during those seasons. The lake is frozen for, you know, at least six months over the year. Uh, and there would have been reasons to just walk over the ice to get to the islands. Anyway, I'm not a believer in the boat scenario. Regardless of that, Native Americans were out on the islands. This is a photograph of Matt Nelson, one of our other archaeologists. He's now the archaeologist uh, down in um, Salmon, Idaho, also for the uh, Forest Service. And he's had a really successful career in cultural resource uh, archaeology and, and was really instrumental to the success of our projects at the University of Montana. Um, and this is him looking at uh, one of the archaeological sites on, on one of the islands. Um, and not just Yellowstone Lake, so you can see Yellowstone Lake off in the distance, but this is a photograph from uh, Sheridan Peak, Mount Sheridan, uh, just over Heart Lake. And so there's lots of Native American use of Heart Lake. And, the, and if you look down below where Caleb Subcheck is standing there, Caleb is now the GIS specialist up, in, uh, up near Kalispell, uh, so we always encourage our archaeology students to use the uh, GIS mapping technology. It's a really useful skill in archaeology. He, uh, both Matt Nelson from the previous slide and Caleb Subchak uh, were really good and instrumental to our use of GIS and just making good uh, maps and things for our for our projects in Yellowstone. So this is Caleb uh, looking down over Heart Lake, but you can see uh, Yellowstone Lake there. Um, in the distance. Uh, and then Grebe Lake, so Grebe's a, a small lake just north of northwest of uh, can the canyon area. If we have our archaeological field school this summer, we'll be back in this area. Uh, lots of archaeology around those lakes. Wolf Lake's another one. Um, a lot of really great, uh, you know, and I think the, the cool thing that I'll try to sh just to hammer home is is that wherever we've looked for archaeological sites, no matter where it, how remote it seems today, there's Native Americans certainly um, were out there using those areas. One of the areas where we didn't find a lot of abundant Native American use, it doesn't necessarily mean that Native Americans weren't going there, is, is Shoshone Lake, ironically named after one of the active tribes that uh, live in the greater Yellowstone Lake system today and are well known to have used uh, Yellowstone are the Shoshone. <laughs> Uh, and the multiple bands of the Shoshone, and Shoshone Lake is named after them. Um, we did a complete circumference archaeological survey of the lake and, and really didn't find a lot of uh, archaeological materials associated with that Native American use. Now, uh, I haven't quite figured out why that is. I, th I think definitely that Native American tribes, and in particular the Shoshone, were living at Shoshone Lake and using it for whatever reason, uh, there just wasn't a lot of archeological material associated with those, with those occupations. So this is one of our students, it's actually Braden Tobin, the uh, individual that took that bear photo at the beginning of the slide show today. 
Uh, just recently in the last few years, one of our focuses has been on the survey of those backcountry trails. And so that has taken us up into the mountains. And uh, we've really enjoyed that. This is a picture of me up on the top of um, the, uh, oh my God, I'm spacing on the name of the mountain now, but uh, it's a really beautiful part of the Gallatin, the Gallatin Range. Um, and uh, just a ton of archaeology. So this is a great example of, you know, places where we've gone, where, you know, if you look at the definition of wilderness, it's a place that isn't uh, amenable to human occupation and just simply hasn't been used by humans. And so a lot of these places that are considered by definition wilderness in terms of the Wilderness Act definition of the early 1960s, I don't think really qualify as wilderness because Every place we've looked that is a defined as wilderness has really extensive history of, of Native American use in the Gallatin Mountains and the high elevation areas of the Gallatins and other places in, in Yellowstone and the greater Yellowstone ecosystem were very actively used for a variety of reasons. One of them uh, up near this area is uh, the availability of a stone material called petrified wood. There's a tremendous amount of it. It's a really beautiful material that Native Americans were collecting to make stone tools. They're also going up into the mountains of the Gallatins, of the Beartooths, of the Tetons, of the Absorcas to have a religious, spiritual fasting experiences. Um, and we're doing so even up into the early 20th century in, in Yellowstone and probably do today as well. And so uh, these are fasting beds that were built and constructed just to protect the person as, as part of the religious ceremony. Once they were up in the high elevation mountaintops with this beautiful center, uh, panoramic view of scenery, they were um, uh, fasting, no water, no food to facilitate that spiritual uh, experience. And so the mountains of Yellowstone were actively used uh, not just to collect stone like in the last slide, but also for religious experiences. Uh, this is a photo of our crew um, up on Fawn Pass, um, which is uh, also in the Gallatin Mountains, and uh, lots of stands of white bark pine trees in, in this region. White bark pine trees are huge nut producers, and in the fall, Native American hunter gatherers all through the Greater Yellowson ecosystem and all through the Rocky Mountains uh, were collecting white bark pine nuts as, as part of their fall hunting and gathering uh, world. So when we were up in the in the Gallatin Mountains, in particular, where there's still pretty uh, substantial white bark pine tree stands, uh, we were finding lots of evidence of, of Native American stone tool production sites, stone circles, uh, heavily, heavily used, intensively used by Native Americans, typically in, in the fall. Um, and so this is another, this is uh, uh, just a, a great photo of our, of our team uh, there on the, what's called the Skyrim Skyrim Trail. If you ever have to do one hike in Yellowstone, if you're wondering if if you, there's, most people think about the Yellowstone hikes as being pretty flattish, rolling hills, but the Skyrim Trails uh, in the Gallatin Range up in the northwestern part of the park, just south of, say, Big Sky Ski Resort, are really beautiful mountainous, mountainous hikes, as you can see uh, from this slide. There's two of our students uh, down there on the, Monty White, I think, is one of those. Monty now is one of the park archaeologist working with Beth Horton, and then the other one is uh, Braden Tobin, who I we just talked about earlier. And there's a picture of Braden ever present with his camera. He, he's a, a budding photographer and uh, took pictures, a lot, a lot of pictures. I, I love this picture that we took of him as he was hiking up to the top of the Skyrim Trail. So not an easy hike. Um, for him it was because he's a great athlete, <laughs> but for me and the rest of us, it was uh, that was a very strenuous hike from uh, up to the top of the of the Skyrim. Then river surveys. We've we've. Uh, I'll try to get through this. Let me look at the time here. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably won't take up too much more of your time. But um, lots of uh, archaeology. Obviously, river valleys. So you know, I think when most of us think about Native American use of places like Yellowstone, this is where you'd expect most of the human use to be. And so we've done archaeological work in the Yellowstone Valley, the Lamar. Madison, Gibbon, Firehole, Snake, and Lewis Valleys, as well as lots of smaller creeks uh, that are tributaries of those. And this is a photograph of a couple of our students. That's Kayla began, and then uh, Colin Price. Colin's an archaeologist working for the um, Forest Service in Colorado. And so that's one definitely been one of the most uh, 
funnest things about these projects is seeing our students graduate and get get jobs and with the experiences that they've had in Yellowstone contributing to that success. This is a project we did down on the uh, Boiling River area, just between Gardner and Mammoth. We always have fun out there. Um, this is a project down we did along the Hayden Valley, just south of Canyon. This is a photo of our team excavating a, a fire pit. Um, down up along Old Faithful and in, in the Firehole River. Um, and then I, our, back to where we started. So our, one of our first projects was the Gardner Basin and we did a lot of fun archeology span there. One of the original covers of, that I envisioned for the book was something that looked like this, which I still prefer over the one they chose. <laughs> Um, and lots of great uh, archaeology in, in those areas, uh, including some great stone circles down along the Yellowstone Valley. Also, the, we do do his, some historic archaeology as well. And so in that area along the Gardner River, the old train town in the, in the late 19th century, before the train Northern Pacific Railroad got to Gardner, there was another town called Cinnabar that was located uh, north of where Gardner is now. Maybe I think it's about seven miles north of Gardner. It's no longer there and it's abandoned, but one of the projects that we did for Ann Johnson originally was to help identify the exact location of where Cinnabar uh, had been. And then we did some excavations at some of the features in, uh, in the town, including at the hotel. We, we found the foundation of that hotel that was used. It was used for about 20 years when the Northern Pacific Railroad uh, got to the park in, I think, 1883 or something. It was the park, um, it was where the train, Northern Pacific train stopped from Livingston uh, before it got uh, moved to Gardner in, I think, 1902, 1903. Yeah, last thing I'm going to talk about uh, in terms of our research, I'm a stone tool guy. I like to understand how Native American hunter-gatherers used and produced stone tools. And so we've done work at a lot of different places where obsidian and volcanic glass has been collected and used by Native American groups uh, in, in Yellowstone. And so Obsidian Cliff is a National Historic Landmark. It's Yellowstone's most important archaeological site. Uh, Native Americans collected obsidian there for 11,000 years, transported all across the country. There's archaeological sites in Ohio. Uh, this is an illustration, again, by our local Missoula artist, Eric Carlson. Uh, of a, a, a religious figure or a shaman that was buried in a mound in Ohio. Uh, and nearby, there was another mound with 300 pounds of Yellowstone obsidian cliff obsidian in Ohio. So pretty, pretty incredible. So the obsidian from obsidian cliff wasn't just locally used by all the tribes there. Certainly it was, but it was also being traded and even possibly collected by people coming all the way from Ohio. Um, then in addition to obsidian cliff, there's lots of other places um, in the park where obsidian is, is available. And one of the things we've done is identify as many sources of obsidian as we can, because once we identify the sources of obsidian, we can trace human movements through the landscape and link every obsidian source has a unique chemical composition. And so when we find artifacts at sites, we can link those to the different obsidian sources. So one of our goals in my research foci, foci has been to identify sources of obsidian. The one you're seeing in the photographs now is called Cougar Creek. It's over by West Yellowstone. And overall, um, you know, just to summarize, we've had a lot of success uh, in our collaborations with Yellowstone National Park, University of Montana, and the Rocky Mountain Cooperative Ecosystem Study Unit. We've had uh, 14 or so master's theses now in the Yellowstone region, three PhD dissertations. None have been in Yellowstone Park per se, but just in, in areas around Yellowstone. Uh, the Before Yellowstone popular book, it's really for lay people trying to translate a lot of the information about Yellowstone Native American history uh, for, the, for the public. And I, I use it in my archaeology of Yellowstone uh, class here at the university. A, a couple other Yellowstone archaeology edited academically oriented volumes, over 30 published articles, public lectures. Everybody wants to hear about Yellowstone. <laughs> and so I've, I've given a lot of these talks over the years. Um, Hundreds of identified sites that, that Yellowstone can, can work about uh, protecting and preserving for the future. Many of those sites have been excavated. Um, dozens of trained students. And, and again, one of the important contributions is that uh, those students have gone on to careers in archaeology. So just looking at the photograph here, the main photograph there, that's Braden. Again, Braden Tobin will be a student. He'll be a professional archaeologist. He's, he's the one going up to University of Alaska for grad school, but he's working as a professional archaeologist for the Forest Service now. 
Kyler Moselle is working as a GIS specialist for the Montana State Historic Preservation Office. And again, that's Caleb Subjack in the back. Um, so that's been the most, like, if I look back on my career in this project, putting our students out as professional archaeologists has far and away been the most important contribution that the project itself has made. And, and we've done that through 37 agreements through the University of Montana, Yellowstone, and the CESU. I just counted them uh, this morning to, to have that number for you. And it's it's not a small number over, what, 17 years. That's two or three agreements per year. We have uh, kept the park busy. And uh, certainly at we owe a debt of gratitude to Yellowstone for being such good partners with the University of Montana and to the Cooperative Ecosystem Study Unit for um, being such a great facilitator of these, these projects. So that's it for the talk, and, and we can open it up to uh, questions if I haven't run on too long here. <laughs> Thank you, Deb. I appreciate you highlighting um, your students on the project. One of the things I love to hear is um, students working on a CESU project and then going on and getting a job with, oh, yeah. um, with the federal agencies. So that's awesome to hear. Um, we do have time for some questions, so if you have questions, um, please um, go ahead and put them in the box. Um, so we have one here. Um, does any of your research suggest to you evidence for one hypothesis or another about how early humans arrived on this continent or traveled into the interior? Yeah, I can't, you know, so... In terms of the peopling of the Americas, obviously it's an it's a Asian origin, Northeast Asia through Beringia down through Alaska. But I'll be honest, and this is what I tell my students in my classes too, is I don't exactly know how people, Native American hunter-gatherers got precisely to say Montana, Wyoming and Yellowstone Park because they could have, like you said, come down the inland Rocky Mountain front <laughs> or so there was an, that inland corridor from Alaska, they could have just walked but they could have also come down the Pacific coast and then up the Columbia River to the Snake River uh, and then gotten into the Oar region through just following river tributaries from the Pacific coast. And the one thing we do know is that the earliest archaeological sites anywhere in the Americas are on the sort of on the Pacific coast, closer to that area. So, um, but none of the archaeology that we have identified in Yellowstone necessarily contributes to that. Although the one Clovis point we found on the southern shore of Yellowstone Lake did come from Teton Pass Obsidian Source, which is down by Jackson on the Snake River. So it's at least theoretically possible that that could have been the migration route of the first Clovis Native Americans coming up the Snake River in, into Yellowstone. We do have some time. Are there any other questions for Doug? If so, go ahead and, and uh put them in the chat box. So Doug, what do you think ha is left to be done in Yellowstone National Park? You know, I, they've only done survey of like, it used to be 3% of the park. Now I think maybe it's more like 5% of the park. So there's still a tremendous amount of archaeology to be done in Yellowstone just because such a small portion has ever been surveyed. So there's, you know, one of the things we just identified recently was the first Native American rock art in Yellowstone. There's got to be more of that out there. That would be fun to find. Um, more old sites. Right now we only have evidence of two of those very early Clovis first Americans archaeological sites, but there's got to be more of those. And so that, that's where I, if I had to do just research in the park, that's where I would dedicate my time. Okay, here's another question. What has surprised you the most from your findings? Yeah, just what I said earlier is that it's just everywhere we've looked, we have found stuff. And so that whole concept of wilderness is a very Eurocentric concept because it doesn't take into consideration 11,000 years of Native American history in those wilderness places. You know, people don't live in most of those places today, but that doesn't mean that Native Americans didn't live there for 11,000 years before. So that was a little surprising, although given what we know about Native American hunter-gatherers, it's not that surprising. But I think when I talk to the public, 
that's what they're most surprised about is that, wow, you know, even up at the 11,000 feet, we have evidence of, of Native American occupation. And then, it, and I think when most people think about use of Yellowstone by Native Americans, it's like, oh, they were just passing through. It was this casual use. They weren't really using it that much. And that's absolutely not true at all. There's sites everywhere uh, and multiple tribes, not just the Shoshone, the Crow, um, Nez Perce, but those are probably the three most prominent, but, you know, lots of dozens of other tribes as well. Doug, do you have any hunches about why Shoshone Lake has a lack of cultural materials or lake shore erosion there compared to other? Yeah, lakes? yeah. So that, that is one thing. So that's a good hypothesis is that um, those, the banks of Yellowstone Lake are very steep. And so any terraces that probably were present in the past, if the wave action probably has wiped a lot of those out. Um, it could also be that a lot of the sites are buried and just not observable on the ground surface. So all of our surveys to date have been just ground surface walking. Um, and so if they're buried underneath the ground, we wouldn't find them. Uh, the other thing is, and I hate to say this, but artifact collection is, a, is, is not legal in Yellowstone. It's not legal in any, any federal tribal lands because of the Archaeological Research Protection Act. But Shoshone Lake is a pretty popular lake for campers. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if some of those artifacts that were on the surface have up and walked away. So um, I think if you did uh, more work, and including a little bit more excavation below the surface around the shores of, of Shoshone Lake, you'd find more. Um, but again, like you said, in that the erosion that's a very steeply incised, those banks are, it, it is a, it, I can see where that could be contributing it to. You could just have so much erosion just washing things into the lake. All right, here's your last chance to ask Doug a question about uh, Yellowstone archaeology. Well, thanks, Doug. We really appreciate you um, being our first uh, presenter for um, this year's uh, uh, seminar series. Um, and for our audience, this um, uh, uh, seminar has been recorded and I'll make it uh, available um, to you all next week. Um, I'll send you the link. Um, please keep in mind that we have um, two more seminars coming up in March and April. And um, you can check those out and register them, uh, register for them on the um, our seminar page link that I, I shared. I'll also be emailing um, uh, more information out about those seminars uh, uh, soon as well. So again, thank you all for joining us for the kickoff of our uh, 2023 uh, online seminar series. And, and thank you, Doug. We um, appreciate you. Uh, sharing about this pretty long uh, project with Yellowstone National Park. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yep, you too.